that we were able to amplify our results like big time. So I want you to know that when the, the, the disaster took place here in Georgia and, and, and Florida and South Carolina, even what's happening right now, we are doing our part with our partner, Samaritan's Purse, to make sure they have a quick response, they have the equipment to get it there. But I want you to know that, praise God, we might be paying for the fuel, we'll be buying the water, we'll be purchasing the stuff, and they'll be sending it out and get there. So thank you guys so very, very, very much. It's offering times, ladies and gentlemen, to learn to give generously. Amen. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hands, and uh, the ushers will help you out. And, and it's so, so very important. I, I, I saw this scripture in Proverbs 11:25 in the NIV this morning. It says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Isn't that good? But I want to show you something in Galatians chapter 6 and 7. Galatians 6 and 7, I'm going to read out of the mirror, the mirror translation. Galatians 6, 7, and I'm going to read 7, 9, and 10 out of the, out of the, the uh, mirror translation. Uh, he says, show business does not deceive God. And what he's talking about is people that kind of show out in church, well, what they do. He says, show business does not deceive God. Do not be led astray and then pull your nose up at God as if it was God who let you down. So you were looking for a harvest, you were looking for something to come to pass, and don't, don't be looking at God as if it was God that let you down. He said, the harvest always reveals the seed. Did you get that? The harvest will reveal the seed. He says, so zero our harvest will reveal there was zero seed. <laughs> He says, he says, all right, so you don't want to talk from the, from the perspective of sowing seeds? All right, let's look at your harvest. Your harvest reveals the seed. And that struck me, and I said, praise God. All I need to do is look at, look at my harvest. It'll tell me everything I need to know about my seed. Then he goes down to verse uh, 9. He says, every good deed has a predictable harvest. Every, see, this is, this is, this is showing me uh, seed time and harvest time. And, and, and a lot of people want to ignore the seed time because anytime you mention money, you think somebody taking it from you because you don't trust that God can care for you. So you go through these little worldly things you hear on YouTube and stuff about your money, your money, your money. And so you just decide, well, I ain't going to give nothing to nobody and I'm going to be safe. No, you're not. Your harvest is going to reveal your seed. And so it says every good deed has a predictable harvest. Let's not get discouraged in the in-between times. How many of you know there's an in-between time? A farmer, farmer calls it stalk time. There's an in-between time. And he says, don't get discouraged in the in-between time because I'm telling you exactly when you need it, how you need it, where you need it, God will take care of you and your harvest will once again reveal your seed. Amen? So this is, this is important. And we're living in a world today that they just don't believe nothing. They don't believe God, the Bible, don't believe nothing. But I'm telling you, if you're gonna, gonna get prepared to live in these last days, the Bible makes it clear. He says, let us take advantage of every opportunity to be a blessing. Take advantage, take advantage of every opportunity to be a blessing. When I'm at a restaurant or we're flying out of town somewhere and I bump into somebody that served me in some capacity, that's an opportunity for me to be a blessing. And I want to experience a wow moment, praise God. Uh, and sometimes, you know, so I, I, we went to some restaurant tapping out the other day, and uh, the guy, he just did an ex, ex, just an extraordinary job of, of, of serving. Plus, he bought me, he bought me two uh, uh, apple, um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, he was, he, was, he was indeed a blessing. <laughs> so I gave him a $200 tip. Wait a minute. He couldn't say nothing. I thought I wanted the wow moment, but when you give somebody a tip and they just look at you and they walk away, I said, you got it, then you God. He said, yeah, we got it, amen. You know the next thing he'll say? Well, where your church at? Every opportunity to be a blessing, amen. Come on, let's go ahead and sow into the things of God. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to give, an opportunity to be a blessing, an opportunity to make sure that our generous giving 
translates into being a blessing in somebody else's life. We thank and we praise you for it right now, that we give out of a cheerful heart, we give out of a heart of thanksgiving, and we give because we want to. <laughs> in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Us just go ahead and receive the offering this morning. Those of you who are at home eating the Word of God, amen. Begin to give into that Word that you're eating, praise God. Begin to sow into that Word that you're, you're eating. There's a principle that God wants us to begin to walk in and to understand, and when we understand that, we're going to see some things take place in the natural, and I thank God for it, amen. Praise God. Well, you're ready to eat this morning. <clears throat> You don't sound like it one bit. <laughs> well, you're ready to eat this morning. Yeah. Yeah. You see, expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. And if you showed up with no expectation, you know, you got, you got to have some expect, you got to expect something, amen? And I'm telling, I'm expecting something. I, I hadn't taught this before. I'm excited because normally when I teach, something comes up that I didn't study. And so I'm glad I finally made it to the, to the what do you used to call this, the holy book board, where there ain't no book, because stuff kept flowing out of me. So I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 and 29 in the message translation. And I want to, this, this, this first lesson in this series today is going to be a lot of teaching and foundation because this, this is literally going to blow your mind. It's like, I promise you, on the inside, when it clicks, you'll say, yeah. But it's just something that we've been doing for so long out of, based in religion. We, you just nobody ever just, you know, we just hadn't thought about it. All right. Verse 28, he says, are you tired? <laughs> Somebody says, sure, yeah. No, he's talking about playing church and religion. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? He said, come to me. Get away with me. You'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. How many of you are ready to take a real rest? He said, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Now, now, remember that he says, I'm not going to lay anything heavy and ill-fitting on you. If you're going to learn the rhythms of grace, I won't be laying anything heavy and ill-fitting on you. And all my life as a Christian in religion, it's all been heavy. He said, keep company with me, and you will learn to live freely and lightly. So I want to start this next series, and I call it Living in the Rhythms of Grace. How does that work? Living in the Rhythms of Grace. Now, uh, I feel led to share this scripture before we, I'm going to tie what we've been talking about into where we're going. Go to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 in the King James. Galatians 2 and verse 20 in the King, King James. Now, this is all about us staying on the bus this morning and really getting a hold of what I'm saying. All right, Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth where? Christ lives where? And the life which I now live in the flesh, so right now we are living life in this physical body, the life that I now live in the flesh, how do I live it? I live that life by the faith of the Son of God. All right, so I'm living my life right now as a born-again Christian in the flesh. I'm living my life right now by the faith of the Son of God. Whose faith is it? Whose faith is it? So he says, I'm living my life by the faith of the Son of God. I'm not living my life by my own constructed faith. I'm living my life by the faith of the Son of God. Now, you have to understand that, you know, Jesus said this. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
So Jesus is a reflection of the Father. We would know nothing about the Father had Jesus not come. Jesus is a reflection, a perfect reflection of the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. So you have to understand that the faith of the Son of God is just a reflection of the faith of God Almighty. Everybody follow me now. So, so the faith of God was wrapped up in flesh called Jesus. All right? So the faith of Jesus Christ is God's faith wrapped up in flesh. Mm -hmm. And God's faith is, 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 is faith where everything is perfect, complete, and done. God called the end at the beginning. So everything about our lives as Christians has already been finished. It's already been done. Faith has come. Faith lived on the earth. People saw faith, experienced faith. They called his name Jesus. Then Jesus got on the cross, and here's what Jesus or faith said on the cross, it is finished. And that's what faith is saying today, it is finished. And so God's faith is finished faith. God's faith is completed faith. God's faith is done faith and can't be undone. So Jesus comes to the earth in flesh in an earth suit with God's faith where everything is finished, it is done. That's why he could do everything he did and went, it went through everything he went through because it was finished. He could go to a hell and not be afraid because his resurrection was already finished. Glory be to God. And then God declares in Romans 12 that I am going to give you the measure. The measure means not you get a measure and you get another measure and you get another measure, or he would have said I give you a measure and then you got degrees of measure. He says the faith that I have, I now put in Jesus, and the faith that we have, you now have that faith because you live by the faith that's in Jesus, which is the faith of God finished, completed, and done. So everything about God concerning you is finished, completed, and done. If you look at Jesus, how he talked when he was on earth, he talked in, 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 in the tenses of finished, completed, and done. He told people that one day I'm going I'm to die, I'm going to spend three days, and you're going to raise it up again. He, 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 he talked like that. And now we are now forgetting about the faith of Jesus the reflection of God, and we are going around talking about, I got my faith, and with my faith, I'm going to try to get healed, and with my faith, I'm going to try to get delivered. Why are you trying to use your faith to perfect something that's already been perfected? You're using your faith, and I don't know where we get the term, if your faith is not his faith, where do you get that faith from? Your faith should be his faith. See, I'm going to tell you what your faith is. Your faith is based on works. Your faith says, I got to add work to my faith in order for my faith to work. <laughs> See, all of our life, we've been living like this. I got to add works to my faith in order for my faith to work. And, and I say, where you get that from? Well, James says that faith without works is dead. And so now you're still adding works to your faith to try to get your faith to work. But James was not saying that you have to add works to your faith to get your faith to work. James was saying if you really got his faith, then from your faith, works are going to come. From your faith, we'll see fruit. From your faith, we'll see proof and evidence. He wasn't talking about adding works to faith so faith could work. God's faith already works. In fact, God's faith has already worked, E.D., It is the invitation to live in the realm of the finished. Yeah. To put all that together, he says, now that you realize who you are and you've accepted me and you're born again, now live in the realm of the finished, the completed, the done. And so whatever needs you see in your life, call it finished, completed, and done. Doctors say you're sick. What do you say? My healing's finished. It's done. You say, well, financially, I don't have the money to meet this particular thing. So you, so you, you don't live in that realm about what you don't have and what you do have. You see what you need and you call it finished because you live in the realm of the finished. You need to try this, folks. See, what you're doing is you're still trying to 
get something to happen because you hadn't realized, excuse my English, it done happened. Stop it. When you, if you have a battle today, the victory is finished. The victory that you need for that battle is completed, finished, done, can't be undone. But you keep trying to come up with a religious five steps. Well, first of all, you need to pray for four hours, and then secondly, you might need to add a little fasting with that. And then thirdly, you need to say these three pages of confession. And then after you say them pages of confession, you need to go love somebody that don't love you. Well, I can't find them. I don't know who they are. There are lots of people. Who don't. And it just adds burdens upon burdens upon burdens, and it makes it hard, and it makes it just tough, and eventually you get so confused you quit. Now, if you're confused with what I'm saying today, you're confused from the simplicity. You're confused because I won't make this difficult. I won't give you a list of things you got to do to make it happen. Only thing I'm saying to you is, whatever you need, it's done. Live. And you're like, I I'm confused. What you confused for? Well, the doctor said I'm sick. Well, God says your, your healing is, is, is done. It's finished. It's completed. I, I don't understand. No, you, it ain't that you don't understand. You, you, don't, you don't receive it because you won't realize that it is done in that realm. And as soon as faith reaches out for what's finished, grace will supply more of what is needed. It's a rhythm. <laughs> Everybody sitting on the book. Now, if, you're, if this is your first time here, I understand you're looking like, what in the world did he just say? I am saying... The day you realize and believe that Jesus is Lord and you accept him into your life, he's already completed everything you'll ever need in this life. He just needs you to realize it, agree with it, and live according to what's done and not to live trying to get it done. Because what I just said is real faith. The other stuff we've been doing, I'm going to use my faith to try to get this done is against what this whole thing is about. It's finished. It's done. Most of the things I'm going to say to you today is going to have to do with your thinking and your thought. Because I'm getting ready to show you something that's just mind-boggling. You just... I'm getting ready to absolutely destroy religion in your life. Wait, wait, let, wait, let me define religion. A return to bondage in the Latin. Religion is, is performance-based. Religion is all about what you got to do to see if you can get God to do something. Religion is I got to be good in order to get God to do something good. That's not according to the New Covenant. That was according to the law, and according to the law, nobody was ever good enough. Yeah. So this is going to be interesting. I'm, I, I, I am teaching this today. It is going to be something that's going to challenge you, and I will start off with this statement that I told Taffy this morning that woke me up and blew my mind. Heaven is not our goal. It's our starting point. God almighty. Now, I'm on, that's, what, that's what I'm going to be explaining to you. Heaven used to be my goal until I found out that I'm already there. Yeah, I sit with him in heaven. What did you say, Rick? I am seated with him in heavenly places. So once you realize that you're seated with him, that ain't my goal. That's been accomplished. I am seat. Oh, see. Now, some of y'all are like, I ain't sitting in heaven. I'm sitting in church. Now, you don't understand. See, you, this is what faith is all about. Faith is receiving what God has already did, done and finished. And your goal, and the goal of most Christians, the goal is to get to heaven. And I am telling you, I am already seated in heavenly places. Heaven is not my goal. Heaven is my starting point. So what we're getting ready to talk about today, <laughs> we're talking about it from the starting point of where I sit. 
Because if you don't talk about it from the starting point of where you sit, then you, you can just forget about it ever being done. I'm going to show you these things God's asking us to do, and I'm going to become an enemy to it at first because he's telling us to, you know, to, 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 to give our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is reason serve, which is completely denying everything and, and giving it to him. And I don't see how that's reasonable to me. How can you make that appeal? How can you ask me to do that? <laughs> Y'all ready? So before we get to that, I'm going to wait ahead of myself. Go to Romans chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. Romans chapter 2, 3 through 4, and then I'm going to read Romans 2, 1 through 4 in the mirror. This is all foundation. I got to get your mind free from religion so you can hear how it is, how it really is. Since I have been living in the realm of the fitness, I, so much has changed. I mean, so much has changed. So much is clear, including the increase of the glory, including the increase of manifestations. Very interesting. Verse 3, he says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou judgest them which do such things, and and dost the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, the riches of his what? The riches of his goodness, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Now, the word repent means. It is the change of mind, to change the mind. It literally means to change the mind. The other scripture says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, change your mind from your way you thought about one thing to the way you think about Basically, in that verse of scripture, it is literally talking about changing your mind from the law to the gospel of grace because that kingdom it was talking about was the kingdom of, of this grace. But he says something here. He says, God's going to use his goodness to lead people to change their mind. And that ain't what I was told. I was told, if you don't change your mind and, and act right and do right, God's going to get you. He's going to put, yeah. put something on you. He's going to take something from you. He's going to hurt you. He ain't going to bless you. And what we created is a fear-based religion. Just back up a little bit. Just back up a little bit. You ain't got to go, go back go about 10, 20 years ago. It, it was all based in fear. You know, God don't like ugly. Hmm? If you don't give, you're going to be cursed. If you get a divorce, then the blessings are going to weaken in your life. And it was, it was, and if you don't come to church, then don't expect for favor to be in there. That's the reason why you can get that job. Because you don't come to church. If you come to church a little bit more, then maybe God will be able to do something for you. And you're coming to church out of fear. You're giving out of fear. And don't pray. Now, if you don't pray like this, then he's not going to hear your prayer. Well, dang, I'm just trying to talk to him. I ain't never met him before. You ain't met Jesus yet? Well, you know what I'm saying. I'm talking to somebody I can't see, I can't hear, and, and then you're telling me I need to talk to him like this. How come I just can't talk to him and he can teach me how to... It's all fear-based. It's fear-based. We have been living in a fear-based religion. Yes, sir. And everything about what we do, and every religion is fear-based. Look at all the religions of the world. They all come with an attachment of fear. Yeah. And he goes so far as saying, you know, if you don't, if you don't shout in church, then... You ain't got no spirit. I'd rather you not. I'd rather you sit down, shut up, and listen to what I got to say. But they tell you now, if you ain't, if you ain't shouting, you ain't full of the spirit. It's all fear. And we bought it. We bought every bit of it. Women ought not wear pants. Well, buddy, you get up in a dress and try to do all the things you got to do then. <laughs> Women ain't supposed to be on the pulpit. And then you, and this is so insulting. I, I, God forgive us. You got to stay on the floor. 
You can't come up to the pulpit. You got to stay on that pulpit. That's for the holy men of God. Stand up here on the floor. Women couldn't do nothing. They couldn't wear no dress. They couldn't put on too much makeup. If you put on too much makeup, you're a Jezebel. Uh, you can't get on the pulpit. You got to preach from the floor. Now, it's all right for you to sing in the pulpit, but now, you know, it, it just contradicted itself because it's tomfoolery. It's a bunch of crock. God's not going to change somebody's mind with that. He says, I'm going to change your mind with my goodness. He said, he says, I'm going to be so good, so good, so overwhelmingly loving, so overwhelmingly good, I'm going to bless you when you don't even deserve it. When you think you're least deserving, that's when my mercy is going to show up and blow your mind because you know you don't. You know you deserve hell. You know you deserve to die. You know you deserve to get caught. You know you deserve to have the disease. You know you deserve it all. But I ain't going to let that happen. And when that goodness shows up, you're going to say, my God, I got to change my mind about God. You know, Bishop Payne, that's all we know, man. That's all we knew. But we promised to never stop growing. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep. And we were never afraid to get up to say, hmm. Know about what I said last week. We, we might need to look at that a little harder. And to the day, to right now, I need you to know all your pastors in this church, we're all digging, digging and digging and digging and digging and digging. And just continue to do it. I mean, what I'm talking to you about now in Romans, Ken bought it up in the middle of a set. Wasn't it? We lifting weights and he bought it up and I'm like, oh God, that's it. God ain't trying to change your mind about him by being bad to you, mean to you, pressuring you. He wants you to want him because you want him. Yeah. Uh. And he says, here's what I'm going to use to change mankind. Goodness. Yeah. And you know, what the, you know what the church has done? The church has become God's opponent and said, no, he's not going to use goodness. He's going to use bad here, wicked there, uh, curse here. You know, God will still curse you. And I'm like, how did we buy that? I'm trying to, I asked myself, how did I buy it? I didn't know no more. I couldn't do no better until I learned better, but I was determined I'm going to keep digging, digging. And I found out that I had to get free from approval addiction because as long as I was searching for people's approval and validation, I would only go so far in serving God with what I taught because I didn't want to, I didn't want to wrinkle the feathers. I didn't want to be the, the, the problem in the body. And, and then I found out that I can't grow no more if I'm still in bondage to people. If, I, if I'm gonna ever find out, I'm gonna have to break free from the approval. And I got to say what nobody else might not want to say. And if they cancel me, and if they get rid of me, and if they don't be, they disfriend me, or all that, it's just got to be like it is. I love God more than all that. I got to see Jesus, and I can't stand in front of Jesus and say, Lord, I was scared. So I just said what they said. I ain't know why they said it, but I just said what they said. And that was what my ministry was, was for about 20 something years. Just said what they said. I don't know if I agree with it, but that's what they say. That's what they say. And then I finally had to ask the question, who is they? <laughs> What's they name? And the same thing about you, if you ever going to really operate in the success that God's wired you for, you got to be free from the people so you can serve God. Yeah. Amen. All righty. I think that's good enough foundation. Y'all ready to get into this? You ready to learn the rhythms of grace? All right, go to Romans chapter 12. Wait, 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 wait. I didn't read this in the... Uh, in the mirror. Let's read Romans 2, 1 through 4 in the mirror, and then we'll get started. Somebody said, I thought you already started. How many starts you going to get? <laughs> well, how many starts you want God to give you? 
Well then. <laughs> All right, watch this. Therefore, old fellow human, by taking what God did in Christ out of the equation, if you take what God did in Christ out of the equation, delivered us, freed us, made us righteous, there remains no alternative way for you to defend your innocence. Your presumed knowledge of what is right or wrong does not qualify you to judge anyone, especially if you, the self-appointed judge, do exactly the same stuff you criticize others for. So he's saying most likely when you criticize others, you're guilty yourself. Isn't that amazing how somebody who can be doing the same thing want to be critical of somebody else, a hit dog holler the hardest, loudest, don't it? Isn't that something? You effectively condemn yourself, he says, when you do that. But in contrast to your judging one another, we have clearly perceived the content of God's righteous judgment. Again, fellow human, why be so presumptuous in your reasoning in keeping your performance-based system alive in your hypocritical Jew versus Gentile judgment of one another? In the process, you are fleeing away from your redeemed innocence, unveiled in the righteous judgment of God. Verse 4, do not underestimate God's kindness. Don't underestimate, and people have. They've underestimated God's kindness. That you think we got to tell everybody they're going to hell all the time. You've underestimated God's kindness. You think they're going to be judged so bad for that stupid thing they did? You underestimate God's kindness. You think they went to hell. You underestimate God's kindness. The wealth of his benevolence and his resolute refusal to let go of us, his refusal to let go of you, you old nasty, no good for nothing, cussing, betraying thing, he, he refuses to let go of you. He refuses to let go of you. Everybody else doesn't let you go, but he refuses to let go of you. It is because he continues to hear the echo of his likeness in us. And thus his patient passion is to shepherd over, is to shepherd everyone into a radical mind shift. His passion is to shepherd us into a radical mind shift. His passion is to get our minds shifted from all this stuff I've been talking about and shift it into the place where we can see God's love and grace and mercy and operation and understand clearly how it applies to our everyday radical living. But you can't live radically until you have a mind shift. So something's wrong with our thinking. Something needs to change in our mind and in our thinking about our relationship with God. What is it that needs to be adjusted about our relationship with God? It's just so easy to go along with the flow of religion. Get dressed, go to church, sing a song, shout, do a cartwheel, hallelujah, come home. And not live none of it. Because in all you're getting, get understanding. And I don't understand what that preacher was talking about. A radical shift in your mind. So you see where this series is about to go. Yes, it will challenge you, but every time you get it, a little piece here and a little piece there, it's going to be a radical shift. And all of the work and the sweat you've put in to try to achieve godly conduct is going to be sweatless because he's going to be working on your heart and your desires to want to. 
Ain't nobody got to threaten you with fear to come to church. You're going to want to. Nobody's got to threaten you with fear that you're not getting no results. If you don't pray, you're going to want to pray. Ain't nobody got to make you stand up and sing no praise song out of somebody. You don't even like that kind of music. But before you know it, it'll be coming out your heart. Ain't nobody even wrote it yet. And it's just flowing out your heart because you want to sing about something that God has done and is doing in your life. Are you listening to me? I have to calculate each time I teach because I'm like, well, Lord, you, you got to bring, if you, whoever you want to hear, you bring them. They ain't got no prize for coming to church on Sunday and, you know, give you $50, we'll bring the most people. And... <laughs> Bro, I've been doing this for 43 years and I'm over all that. I am over all that. Now, I'll have to admit to you, I, I had a really close friend of mine to go home to be with the Lord this week and it, it, it bothered me. It, it hurt me. I weeped and I just thought about all the times we shared and all of the radical attacks we launched against the kingdom of darkness. Uh, and it just seems like all of these guys I preach with and walk with and loved and uh, yeah, yeah, because I'm human. I had, a, I had a human moment, you know. I had a human moment when I came in here. I had a human moment. But it is, it is his unfathomable love. And this preaching that gets me stronger and stronger. And I just like it. I love cooking in this kitchen. Love cooking this kitchen. I had I I went to a, another a camp meeting Friday. I don't I don't do many of them like I used to, but I went to preach. And the reason why I don't go to much of them because it ain't in this kitchen, and I'd have to start all over again. And don't nobody know what I'm saying anyway. And I, and then I just repented of that, and I said, Lord, just show me what to say. And He took what it took me a month to teach y'all, and did it, and voila, and I got it out in about an hour and twenty minutes, and it changed their whole life. So, y'all ready? Yes, sir. Somebody said, I thought you'd start preaching. I, I done told you, this is my fourth start. <laughs> I mean, are you, are, you, are you interested in what we, this, this series, this series, if this series doesn't do it, where your conduct is concerned, you're always walking out of here, either you worrying about your conduct or somebody condemning you about your conduct or, or you think that the heavenly goal is in, 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 in trouble because of your conduct. Now, am I going to give you a license to have bad conduct? Well, you, you I, listen to what you're saying. It, <laughs> it's inconsistent with who you are. It's inconsistent with who lives in you. To act crazy like you think I'm telling you to act crazy is inconsistent with who is in you. So that ought not be a question no more. You know, not to be asking me, is it a sin to drink wine and get drunk? Is it inconsistent with who lives on the inside of you? Instead of you trying to find all the loopholes, quit looking for the loopholes. Well, the Lord let David have 300 women, you know. I ain't asking but for one more. <laughs> and you can't handle the one you got already at home. Is that consistent with who lives in you? You see, I'm glad I have a personal relationship with Jesus because people are going crazy. These folks all online, this ain't right, this ain't true. Throw the Bible away. I don't even know if there was a Jesus. There ain't no heaven. There ain't no hell. I mean, the Bible says he created hell for the devil and his angels. We know that at least. But dear God, they just all over the place. And then you got a bunch of young preachers in there that just, they in there and they ain't they, they not submitted to nobody. They don't want to be submitted to nobody. Stay out of my business. I'm going to do it the way that Lord telling me. But you don't realize the Lord ain't talking to you. You're speaking to a foreign spirit. <laughs> I'm glad I know him. So when I hear something, I'm like, that ain't you, is it? He said, no. Well, I mean, he told me my right address. Honey, you can get your address off Facebook. 
Just find out who coming there and then go to that friend who follow that friend who follow that friend who you know going to be at church tonight, find out their address, and they say, ooh, the Lord says, 2248 Fairburn <laughs> Lane 30125. Oh, you got my address! Ah! Now, you done bought into it because you forgot that the Bible talks about lying wonders. Yeah. Yeah. So you done subjected yourself to a big magic trick. I want them to do that stuff to me. All right, okay. yeah, just cause you, yeah, you, oh yeah, that's my address, but I still don't sense God. So you can say something else right. I still don't sense him. I smell a devil somewhere. You don't have that without a relationship with the Holy Ghost because the Bible says the Holy Ghost will, will tell you things and reveal things to you. But if you don't have a relationship with God That's right. and you're just walk, walking around, you know, spontificating because you want people to know that you have a deep uh, 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 knowledge of the Scripture. This is like you're going around. You remember them, them Bible Scriptures we used to listen to, you know, and in Genesis chapter 2, and the Lord said, and you listen, I'm like, what you listening to them for? You don't know what they're saying. <laughs> well, I just need the Spirit. That ain't how you get the Spirit. You have to have a personal relationship, Right? Okay. Now, I don't mind y'all shouting now, just as long as you listen to what I'm saying now. Don't be talking while I'm talking and you ain't hearing what I'm saying. Because it'll irritate me because I'm like, I'm saying something that's going to change your life and you talking while I'm talking and I know you didn't hear me because you were saying what you were saying while I was saying what I was saying and I need you to hush and listen to what I'm saying so it can get in you. Amen. All right now. I ain't called no names yet, but come on now, come on. I ain't playing church. I, I hate playing church. I hate, I, hate, I hate even the sense of playing church. It get on my nerves because I done been there and it ruined my life. Now, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Let's get started. All right, now watch this. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, I beseech you, therefore, therefore is huge. Because you don't ever use therefore without considering what was said before. Therefore says there was something that took place in the previous chapters that brought you to a place to say, Therefore, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, I beseech you, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what? Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, notice, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, he asked for two things here. Number one, he asked for you to surrender your body to him. And number two, he asked for you to surrender your mind to him. These two scriptures ask for a complete surrender to God. So this involves the mind as well as the body. So there's a plea here. There is a request here. There is, I call it an appeal. And that plea is that the body be made a living sacrifice. That's the plea. Now, I'm not telling you that's what you ought to do. I'm telling you what it's saying right here. And then I'm going to become an enemy to this. The plea is that the body be made a living sacrifice. The word sacrifice signifies a change of ownership for the purpose of being consumed and that for the benefit of the new owner. So the word sacrifice, all right, 
changing who owns it for the purpose of being consumed. So he's asking for your body to go out of your ownership and put into the ownership of God, and God says, I want to consume it, and, and then it's going to be the benefit of the new owner. So God's saying, I want your body, turn it over to me, I'm going to consume it, and it'll be for the benefit of the new owner. A sacrifice is presented by man to God. And it is something that has real value to the one who offers it. So it's value to me to offer what he just asked for. Now, if you'll remember in the Old Testament, that which was sacrificed to God had to be perfect. If you're going to sacrifice it to God, it had to be perfect. We, what he's asking for is we know it ain't perfect. But in the Old Testament, the sacrifice had to be perfect. Anything with a blemish or any defect whatsoever was not acceptable to him. Now, the sacrifice here in question is to be a living one that he's talking about. So this can only mean that the sacrifice of the believer's body, if it's a living one, the sacrifices of the believer's body, it is to be continuous and one that brings forth results. So he's talking about sacrificing your body, living sacrifice, it's going to be continuous, and it's going to bring forth results. It is also to be holy and acceptable unto God. It's supposed to be holy and acceptable unto God. Okay, so without God, it ain't holy, and it's not acceptable. But if it's going to be received right, it's supposed to be holy and acceptable unto God. This is, the only poss this is only possible when the body is pure and undefiled by sin. So the body's got to be pure, it's got to be undefiled by sin in order for it to be holy and acceptable unto God. Kind of similar to what he required in the Old Testament when they had the um, sacrificial offerings. Those sacrificial offerings had to be without blemish. And then he goes around and he says that this sacrifice in this verse of Scripture is called your reasonable service. It's called your reasonable service. Now, to give one's body entirely to God, to be burned out in service for him, to deny oneself all the things that are pleasant to man, to deny oneself of all the things that are pleasant to man, to, de to deny oneself of all the things that are pleasant to man for his sakes, it seems to man a most unreasonable thing, and yet it is called a reasonable service. So why should anyone give, give up all that is pleasing in this world if God so wills and lives solely to please him? That should be the question of a human. Why should I give all this up to solely please him? And in addition to the sacrifice of the body, the entire being should be transformed by the renewing of the mind so as not to be conformed to this world, but to be conformed to the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. We need to figure this out. I know we've read the Scripture, and you know what we did when we read the Scripture? By our willpower, we tried to make it so. And it never did work. You, you, you've never been able to give your body holy and acceptable unto God. You just acted like you did. All right, now, you, you follow me now? Now, watch this. Now, the renewing of the mind has to do with the intellect. Man is a spirit being. He possesses a soul. He lives in a body. Your spirit and your soul are not the same. We have used them interchangeably as if they are the same. You have some people say soul, and they say, I mean spirit and spirit. No, no. You are a spirit being. You possess a soul, and you live in a body. That's the three-part being of man, spirit, soul, body. Your soul has your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your soul possesses your intellect, your feelings, your, 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 your thinker, your filler, and your chooser is in your soul. When he talks here about renewing the mind, 
He is dealing with the intellect. It is not the emotions that are, that are considered here. The intellect is more stable than the emotions or the feelings. So he's referring to the intellect. So what Paul urges in self-sacrifice can never be made to seem reasonable on the basis of any human argument, and yet it is called a reasonable service. So what then makes it reasonable? The whole issue rests on the introductory words of Romans 12. What makes it reasonable? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, watch this, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. It is only because of the mercies of God that it is reasonable for those called brethren to comply with what he's asking. In fact, it's not going to be able to happen without the mercies of God. We're used to saying, present your bodies to, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God with your reasonable servant. And we conveniently miss out on, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, I'm making this appeal. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to do something based on my mercy. I'm asking you to do something based on what I've already done. I'm not asking you to do this because you're not going to be able to do this unless you do this based on my mercy. Glory to God. All right. Now, all of this being true, it is essential for us uh, who, who, who are going to make this sacrifice, we have to understand the mercies of God. Because the word therefore, again, shows that Paul rests the whole argument on that which he has in the preceding chapters taught about the mercies of God. I beseech you, brethren, based on the mercies of God. Therefore, so we got to go back and see what he already said about the mercies of God so we can clarify the therefore part. If you understand that, say amen. amen. So as Paul pleaded on the basis of the mercies of God, it is perfectly clear that this appeal is without force until these mercies are known, understood, and accepted. Until we know about these mercies that he talked about in chapter 1 all the way up to 12, if, until we know about these mercies, until we understand these mercies, until we accept these mercies, the, the appeal here is never going to be done until we understand that. Now, on the other hand, if the studies of these mercies of God are neglected and we don't study them and we keep doing like we've done for so long, just take that scripture and then just play with it religiously and we don't understand the mercies of God, then, you know, there's no reason to heed it in the first place. Now, it then becomes, uh, the, the next two phrases, you need to write them down, you need to tuck them away, you need to never forget them. It then becomes evident that Neglect of the study and the teachings of the doctrines of grace. If you neglect the study and the teachings of grace, if you neglect the studies and the teachings of grace, how many people is that in the body of Christ? Well, it was all of us at one time, wasn't it? If you neglect the study and the teachings of the doctrines of grace, it can lead to nothing else but failure in godly living. Where, where godly living and your conduct is concerned, if you neglect the teachings of grace, you will not be successful in godly living. We've been successful in religion, but we've not been successful in godly living. We either go to one extreme or the other extreme. And then when we first mentioned grace, people thought, well, I can use it as a license to sin. Grace is not a license to sin. But on the other hand, there's this condemnation part that comes when you do sin. And we're, we're not going to be successful in godly living if we neglect the teachings of grace. Now, here's the next point. Grace then, grace here has always, it's got to always be laid as the foundation for any appeal that God makes. Any appeal that God's made that God makes is going to have to be founded on what God has already done for the believer. Now, think about it. Anytime you're reading the New Testament and he's saying, I want you to 
put somebody's knees above yours. I want you to walk in love. I want you to present your body. Amen. All of that's got to be based on what God has already done. If we keep trying to do what God is asking us to do and it's not based on what God has already done for us, we're just not going to be successful. And then with that as a basis, then he makes the appeal for conduct. And then that is reasonable only in the view of that which God has already done. So if God is asking you to love one another, that's got to be based on his grace that says he loved you first. Or you'll try to love somebody out of your own ability instead of being based on what he's already done. We love him, 1 John 4, 19, because he, what, first loved us. And so what happens, our empowerment comes from what he has already done. So when he asks me to present my body as a living sacrifice, I'm going to show you all of the things he's already done with your body, including having it preserved and seated in heavenly places, including saying he's going to raise it up, including says he's going to change it, include it says he's going to deliver it from the wrath to come, including that he also going to glorify it. That would make it reasonable. That would make it reasonable. Are you listening to me now? Now, let's get into this now. Come, let's focus. So, let's do what I just said. Let's go and look at the mercies. <laughs> let's know them. Let's understand them. And let's accept them. So let's look at a brief reference of the mercies of God uh, based on what Romans, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. So we start off with Romans chapter 1. And you can write this down. Romans 1 and 8, one, one, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to Romans 3 and 20. Why are you giving us this? Because I don't want you to just sit up here and trust what I say. I want you to go home and read it. Say, let me see what this man's saying. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to Romans 3 and 20, it deals with the sinfulness of man. And it concludes that there is none righteous, no, not one. <laughs> there is none that seeketh after God. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. In fact, go to, go to, go to Romans 3, go to Romans 3, verse 10 through 19. Let's, let's read this. This is, this is, uh, this is pretty amazing here. Romans 10, Romans 3, verses 10 through, through 19. All right, so, so look at what he said about, this is, this is about all human beings, all mankind. And, and he said this about the old covenant, and then you, you're going to wonder, how do we get out of this? As it is written, there is none righteous. Now, listen to me. You can't say that for today. This is what it was before Jesus came. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of apse is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. 19. 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So now you can see right there that man is shown to be incapable of doing anything whatsoever that is acceptable to God. Before Jesus, he couldn't do nothing that was acceptable before God. And he was guilty before him, and man is subject to everlasting condemnation based on this. But if you'll keep reading the Scripture in verse 20, it talks about a righteousness of God. It talks about 
but a righteousness of God has been made and manifested by Jesus Christ. And this righteousness is offered to all men, even to those whom it was said there is none righteous. Moreover, it is upon all who believe in Jesus Christ. In other words, he is justified. All of this has been made possible by the redemption that is in Jesus Christ because he on the cross sanctified or satisfied the demands of God's justice. And God is therefore free to count everyone righteous who believes in Jesus Christ. All of this has been accomplished by God for man apart from any human effort. Now, let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 20 and 22 in the mirror translation. So the deal was man based on what we just read, is shown to be incapable of doing anything right, anything acceptable unto God. And then, so, so he couldn't do nothing that was acceptable unto God, so Jesus showed up and did something he couldn't do. Look at this, verse uh, 20. The law proves all of mankind equally guilty and confirms that their most sincere duty-driven decisions and self-help programs within the confines of the flesh could not give them any sense of improved confidence in their standing before God. We are now talking a completely different language, the gospel. The gospel unveils what God did right, not what we did wrong. The gospel talks about what God did right, not what we did wrong. The gospel talks about what God did right, not what we did wrong. Religion talks about what we did wrong and won't tell us what God did right. Next verse. Both the law and all the prophetic writings pointed to this moment. It pointed to this moment where the gospel would begin to show us what God did right. We could do nothing right before the eyes of God, but Jesus showed up and made us righteous. Woo. Next verse 22, Jesus is what God believes about you. Jesus is what God believes about you. He looks at you and he says, ooh, I see Jesus. Everything Jesus is, you is. <laughs> Jesus is righteous, you righteous. Huh? Jesus is holy, you holy. Jesus is perfect, you're perfect. Jesus, uh, Jesus is what God believes about you. Glory be to God. He doesn't believe all of that other stuff. He doesn't believe that you're unrighteous. He doesn't believe that you're just a sinner. You're, he doesn't believe any of that anymore. Now that Jesus has come, without your help, without your bringing anything to the table, without you deserving it, without you earning it, you didn't do nothing, you didn't do nothing, nothing. And nothing at all, and then Jesus showed up and said, I'm going to do everything right. You did everything wrong. I'm going to do everything right, and I'm going to invite you into my right. I'm going to let you have my right even when you ain't do nothing right. <sighs> Jesus is what God believes about me. Say that. Say it again. Jesus oh, let me see if you got it. Jesus believes you're righteous. Jesus believes you're redeemed. I'm redeemed. Jesus believes you're holy. Jesus believes you're delivered. Jesus believes you're prosperous. Jesus believes you're healed. Hey, glory to God. Ho -ho. Y'all don't hear what I'm trying to say. He's trying to, he's trying to, he, he's trying to move you over to the realm of the finish. He sent the moving trucks. Glory to God. And he's trying to get you out of all of the things that you could never do. Jesus is what God believes about me, hallelujah. When the devil says you're no good, when the devil says you're going to hell, when the devil says you can't ever do nothing right, when the devil says you ain't holy, you ain't righteous, you ain't heaven bound, you tell the devil, heaven's not my goal, it is my starting point. I already sit with him in heavenly places. 
in Christ Jesus. A radical mind shift. A radical mind shift. Some people, some people might not want to shift this way, but ain't nothing in living conduct going to work right until you shift this way because you can't do nothing without him. You got to realize his mercy is the basis of your godly living. Uh, his mercy is the basis of your godly living. You keep trying to be like God without God. You keep, and that's religion. It's a big pretense. Your Christian religion has become your Halloween costume. God, dog. Glad I'm delivered from preaching. Glad I ain't got no approval addiction. Because I, I see this. People are using their Christianity as their disguise. And you can tell it's a disguise, because when it's time to love somebody, it don't come out. You just got the disguise on. When it's time to help somebody, it ain't there. You just got the disguise on. When it's time to speak blessings to somebody, you're speaking to curse. You're just wearing the disguise, and you show up once or twice a month to add validity to your disguise because you believe that, that people buying this. And the world, this is just a strange thing. The, the, the ch more, more church people buy it than, than, than unsaved people. Unsaved people see right through your disguise. They see you fake and phony. I apologize, y'all. I got to preach like it's my last sermon. I got to preach like there's no tomorrow. That's why, that's why you need to learn how to act like your authentic self and quit trying to be fake and pretend like you. What's wrong? I, I ain't like that. I, I, I don't be going in my wife's bedroom and, 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 and tonight, my night, you know, uh, 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 thou is Taffy, Sister Taffy. <laughs> oh, ho hallelujah. Do you, do you feel the presence? I ain't going in there like that. I'm like, I'm going in there. Put the little rolls on, girl. Let's get this thing going, boy. Hey, you'll never find. Hey. You, 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 you sitting up there trying to find the scripture you're going to read for y'all. What, 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 is, what, what is that? <laughs> and this society today sniffs out your disguise. Yeah. This generation smells your phony fakeness. And the church has perfected phoniness. We'll sit in church and shout hallelujah all day and cut, tell you where you can go, how you can get there, and what to say when you arrive. I'm over it, man. I'm going to stand before Jesus and say, I left it all on the field. I left it all on the planet. I gave you everything I possibly knew I could, could give you. At whatever cost. Well, you keep doing that. Everybody in your church going to leave. I done preached to these blue seats before. I ain't scared. <laughs> During the pandemic, I got plenty of practice preaching in this dome with nobody in here. And I'm not trying to be, you know, none. I'm just, I'm just saying to confirm my, my, my commitment to say and to teach 
what I believe is the authentic truth of God by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit without being afraid of not getting your approval. I don't need your approval to teach what I'm teaching. <laughs> like my wife say, I'm grown. <laughs> I'm grown. <laughs> One, one of our girls asked, said, how come you didn't tell us, how do y'all, why come y'all didn't tell us you were going out of town? <laughs> Tabby said, what? <laughs> I'm grown. I don't need your approval to go out of town. <laughs> oh, man, my time up, y'all. Uh, we're going to pick up. We're going to pick up with this next week. We just we take our time, go through it, and, uh, you know, just dig in it like we did today. You, you got what you need today. Go in, and get on it and, and then come back next week, and then we'll make a second installment and come on next week. We'll, in this series, I'm going to talk about the promptings of grace. Grace will prompt you to do stuff, and I'm going to be talking about fornication. A lot of y'all having sex. Uh, a, a prompting of... <laughs> A lot of y'all having illegal sex. I'm prompting. You, you, you're, you're having illegal sex in the name of grace. It's, it's your, I'm, I need to, the, the grace prompts you. The grace prompts you. You, 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 you still believe in that uh, compromise has no uh, coincidence, so no uh, consequences. And a uh, lot of sex going on in the church. You think I don't know? A lot of drinking and a lot of sex. Well, these people getting up out of here now, boy. God <laughs> dang. <laughs> so I'll see y'all next month. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Y'all get anything out of that this morning, man? I just, I know that. Oh, dear God. Help us to make the decision to either please you or to please self. Oh, God, you've done it all. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mm. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am awaiting, kneel dead and still. Mm. Have thine own way. Lord, have thy own way. Do that part again. Thou art. He gonna mold us and make us. Today, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe you had an aha moment at your seat. I don't know. But you're saying, Lord, I, I need you. 
I need a savior. I've been trying to do this stuff all by myself, and it, just, it hadn't been working. It worked for a little while. I feel pretty good for a little while, and then, bam, it's just... And I want to I wanna live a life that's pleasing to you, I, 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 but I can't do it without you. Because I make a lot of mistakes, and I need you to help me so I don't beat myself up so bad. And help me with this radical mindset. If that's you today, and you're not born again, and you simply want to give your life, you want to say, Jesus, I need a Savior. I, I realize that sitting in this church this morning, I realize I need a Savior. I realize that me by myself is not enough. Help me, Lord. If that's you, would you get your Bibles and personal belongings? Would you meet me down front? And come on, I, I don't want to take all day doing this. I'm not going to take all day doing this either. Either it is or it ain't, amen? Either you realize it or you don't. But if you realize you need a Savior, come on, man. We've dismissed religion, and we've made our mind up that we're going to live for Christ and for Him alone. And then last but not least, if God's calling you to join this church, World Changes Church International, it's on you too. You and God. That's what this is about, you and God. No, by, no pressure, no this. It's just you making a decision. Because a, a lot of churches don't have altar calls anymore. I don't know why. But I think there's something powerful that happens when you come to the altar. I think something so powerful takes place when you come to the altar. And so we're going to sing a little bit more of whatever they planned on singing before they started singing this. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond if you want to get born again, if you want to recommit yourself, you want to join the church, whatever you want to do, we open the altar up for you to come do it right now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that the blessings of God will be upon their lives and all that they are to accomplish. Let them discover the will of God that you have for them. And we thank you for that in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, if you'll turn this way and follow this gentleman to the prayer room, they're going to take you and minister to you, give you biblical understanding of how to obtain and maintain what you can receive. You'll never be the same again. God bless you. Congregation, let's stand for the final blessing. Thank you guys so much for coming to church, sitting and learning and listening and taking notes and praising God and laughing with us and all that kind of stuff. We are grateful for you. And now, may the spirit of grace be with you all this week. I bind the spirit of chaos and confusion over your life. 
I bind the spirit of pressure and, and distress and stress over your life. I declare peace, peace over your life. And for every mountain and challenge that shows up this week, we declare grace, grace over that thing right now. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Remember the volunteer recruitment in the fellowship hall. Have a great day today. Hey. Amen. Amen, amen. Ain't nothing like being a world changer, Listen, I'll tell you the truth. Nothing, nothing like, it. like it. Man, <laughs> amazing, amazing service. Um, we, of course, thank you all for joining us yes. this amazing and beautiful Sunday. Yes. Man, beautiful Sunday. Beautiful Sunday, but boy, God's word. God's word. Listen, nothing like world Woo. changers, I'll tell you the truth. Um, now, we, of course, know that you all are, like, still beaming and still like, oh, Lord, 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 and you're, you're going over your notes, and we're so excited that you have been blessed by this message, but also, share some of those nuggets in the comments right now, and also be sure to share this message not only with yourself, yes. but also with someone that you love, that you're like, hey, you listen, you need this, because listen, we all do, okay? <laughs> so, Ayana, what's something you got out of service today? All right, guys, for me, that one punch, like, heaven is not our goal, it's our starting point. We are already seated with him in heavenly places. Listen. So it's not our goal, you know, we've always heard, I'm just trying to get to heaven, trying to get to heaven. That is not our goal. That no. is our starting point. Yeah. We are already seated with already him. Already seated. Like, man. Already man, seated. Man, man. Listen, it, that in itself, like, just knowing that this mm -hmm. is where we start from, exactly. our launching pad, like, it's already completed, so, done, so and finished. Next? So what's next? What's next? What's next? Trust God. Woo -wee. Listen, boy. All right, now. Uh, so what, about what, you? I, what I got, um, one of the many that I got, um, if your faith is not his faith, where do you get your faith from? Exactly. Because uh, your faith isn't based on your work. It's based on Jesus. It's his faith. Listen, it is his faith. His it faith. is not my faith. And it's not about my work. It's about what he did because, yep. again, it's completed, finished, and what? Finished, done. Done. <laughs> Watch Over. out now. Over. My drop. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, share this message with someone, man. Also, catch the replays throughout the day. Um, just let it continue to renew your mind and, and come to this reality of the fact that heaven is your starting point. Mm -hmm. Like, that is it. All right? Listen. Amen. All right. So now we want to move into an opportunity. If you did not get the chance during service to be able to give, we want to make sure that you have that opportunity right now. We have a few different ways that you can participate. So, Ayana, what are, what are some of the ways that can participate? The four ways to give. You can first text World Changers and leave a space. Add your amount to 74483. Mm -hmm. You can call 866-477-7683, or you can mail us 2500 Burdett Road, College Park, Georgia, 30349, or you can also give online at worldchangers.org and creflodollarministries.org. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right, man. Listen, we are cheerful givers, yes. and the fact that we get to. We get man, to. Listen, heaven is our starting point. It's like, sad. what? We get to. Listen, all right. So we want to make sure that you are in the know of a few upcoming announcements that mm -hmm. we have. Of course, to even start off, as Dr. Dollar just mentioned, now I know you were watching online. Yeah. Now, but it's just but if so you live happy. down the street, you down the you street, know. you like, I'm getting a little breakfast. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, come on back down. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're having our volunteer recruitment fair happening right now. Yes. Right now. From 1230 to 3. That's so you right. got time. You got time. You got time. You got time. So you can uh, connect with the, the different ministries, find out the different volunteer opportunities that we have here at World Changers, and get spiritually employed. Yes. We have a plethora. We were over a there plethora. earlier, and uh -huh. we saw all the tables, and it was exciting just to see all of the ministries yeah. coming together. Yeah. And, you know, some of us serve in several different ministries. Yeah. So we're a whole team. <laughs> over here, Listen, man. It's a family. Get, get involved with the family. Get plugged in. Yes. Okay, we're not changing the world for nothing. We're not changing the world just sitting in the seats. No. We're getting out there. Yes. Okay? And like Pastor said, yeah. it was one thing he said about community and making the church smaller. Like, yeah. that's definitely it. When he talked about lifelong friendships, we have had uh, established lifelong friendships right. through serving. We I mean, met through we serving. We met through serving, so. <laughs> we listen. got married serving. Exactly. All so. right, now. It, listen. Message. <laughs> <laughs> but if you would like more information, if you just so happen could not make it, you can simply email volunteer at worldchangers.org and get involved. Okay? Amen. Amen. All right. So next up. Next up. <laughs> 
<laughs> Next up. So, uh, <laughs> young adults, those 18 and up, we want you to join us for a night of community, worship, and fun as we relaunch Shift, Shift <laughs> the College of Young Adult <laughs> Ministry of World Changers. Now, we're relaunching next Tuesday, October 22nd at yep. 7 p.m. We're going to be in the admin building. Again, come connect, come connect, come connect. Meet other young adults just like you. Now, this is for young adults. This is not youth and young adults. We got a team ministry. But we're talking about the young adults. 18 and up. We got up. you. We talk about adult things. We have adult conversations. And we get to know the real God where he is. Yes. Okay? Because we don't just know about God. We, we know, know God, God for ourselves. Yep. So we want you to uh, simply text the word SHIFT to 51555. So you can also sign up and just let us know that you're coming. Or if you want more information, email SHIFT at WorldChanges.org. Yes. And man, it's going to be a time. And our last announcement for the day, I'm actually excited about this one, too. Mm -hmm. Hello, family. We've got our <laughs> fall festival coming up. Yeah. So come on out to our annual fall festival on Saturday, October 26th from 11 to 3 p.m. Get ready for free candy, balloon sculpting, face painting, and so much more. Mm -hmm. Dress up in your fun uh, costumes. I still got to get my girls' costumes together. Yeah. But last year, they had a lot of fun. Every yeah. year we come, they have so much fun. So if you want to come out and you want more information, text Fall Fest to 51555 or you can visit worldchangers.org and we hope to see you there. That's right. Man, listen, World Changers, we already have had uh, uh, the start of a lifetime this uh -huh. morning because, man, just take it from here. The fact that heaven is your starting point, like, and you can go forward just knowing that, man, it's already been completed, finished, and done. Yes. There's nothing held back from you. God got you. God loves you, and he is nothing but good to you. I yes. want to shower you with his goodness. Amen. Man, listen, you better have you a good day because you get to. You get go to. Go get something good to eat, okay? Love on somebody, uh, hug somebody, and let somebody know, man, God is good. Yes. Okay? So you all have an amazing, have amazing great, Sunday. Have a great, great Sunday, guys. We yeah. love y'all so much, and we will see y'all next week. <laughs> Are you ready to step into your power? Are you a radical woman who knows her worth and is ready to revolutionize the world with your authentic, unstoppable self? Join us for Taffy Dollar's 2025 Radical Women's Conference, March 20th through the 21st. This is your moment to rise, to claim your place, to be seen, heard, and valued for the incredible woman you are. Register today and let's change the world.